Desolate roads leading to nowhere are paradoxical, as every road has its own intentions for which it was designed. While all roads will never lead to just one place, all roads do lead someplace. And if the hands of time see fit to reclaim the land and its pathways, destinations and intentions are doomed to the languish of seasons, ages, and eras. But sometimes, a road or destination makes such a profound mark on its surroundings that its impact resonates with the community that has come accustomed to its presence. In these cases, time and weather have no effect as people, living beings of perception, carry it with them, passing its memories down to kin, so that these conjurings may live on, short of all but immortality. Most of us are liable to pass by these things every single day without knowing it, but the fact remains that some remain who remember. I was riding into town my first time I saw it. My father took up a new job outside of Richmondville, New York, as a professor at the local agricultural college in Cobleskill, a short ten-minute commute from Richmondville. My head was turned, locked onto the window, and the fleeting images beyond, distant in ponderings regarding my upcoming new social environment. What were the kids going to be like? Would I make new friends? Thoughts seemed to rush through my mind as fast as the scenery outside of the car. Nothing but pine forest as far as the eye could see, and given how thick with flora the woods of the area was, one could not see very far. But despite the speed, the density of the forest, or the faded nature of its presentation, I saw it for the very first time anyway. See you soon? What the hell was that supposed to mean? A large, old wooden sign whose lettering had become chipped, cracked, and worn sat out of place in the forest, just within distance enough to be able to discern it within the woods surrounding it. See you soon. But set far enough within the tree line to lend itself as obscure and out of place. The placard almost purposefully awkward, facing the road, as if it sat patiently in wait for some unknown passerby to turn off the road and head straight into the woods with some sort of unknown yet rational ambition. But my thoughts on the strange phrase fleeted by as fast as we sped by it, and months would pass before I would think about it again. I was in my new school for only a quarter before I had gained myself a good group of companions and found myself in the companionship of my newly found girlfriend, Stephanie. We had been going out merely a week before the events of one fateful day that would unfold to form one of the most tragic memories that I still carry with me. I'd stopped at my locker to grab my books for earth science and algebra, Stephanie halting as she walked towards her next class, taking advantage of both our daily routines. A quick kiss on the cheek so as to not attract the attention of the school disciplinarian, and off we'd go to our separate ways, our schedules not bringing us together until our lunch period. See you soon, Stephanie said as she turned to leave. It was at that moment that I remembered that strange sign in the woods on the outskirts of town, but... I would not get a chance to make further inquiry until lunchtime. Hey, how's your day going? Stephanie asked me as I sat down beside her, tray full of compartmentalized slop in hand. Not bad. Hey, I've been meaning to ask you something. I prepared her. Ask me what? Outside of town, headed out on Route 7 on the right-hand side of the road, there's this sign... It's in the woods a ways, and it says, See you soon, Stephanie interjected. Yeah, that. What the hell is that for? I asked, the awkward and unsettling fixture rising to conscious thought. 
That's part of an old local legend about Ambivalence Grove. You probably haven't heard it yet, have you? He inquired. The rest of the table squabbling over petty adolescent issues, oblivious to our hushed and private conversation. N no, not yet. There's a local legend about this place? You mean like Slender Man or Bigfoot or something? I enthusiastically prodded, excitement washing over me at the thought of immersion within my very own hometown myth. I've never seen anything but that old sign cooperate the truth of it all. But that sign has been out in those woods for as long as I can remember. Some of the older people in town, <laughs> my dad included, tell a story of an old forgotten place up on the hill, through the woods past that sign. A quarry town by the name of Ambivalence Grove, its landmark sign long since deteriorated, leaving only the sentimental statement between there and the township's billboard to remain standing till this day. The one that says, see you soon, she continued, and I listened intently. Now if you herd through these woods and head up that hill, all you'll find is the remnants of old foundations and overgrown trails. Formerly dirt roads. He paused. Okay, so why is this place considered legendary or whatever? I implored her. Because no one knows what happened there. The story goes that the town seemed normal enough. Its residents pleasant to talk to and scenery mundane. But there were claims of heinous acts, unspeakable deeds performed by its citizens behind closed doors and beyond the sight of outsiders. No one ever discovered anything concrete or damning, <laughs> so rumors remained speculation. Until one day, everyone in amb ambivalence just vanished. Tales passed down recall freshly made pies and cups of tea left to sit upon tables and counters. The tracks of animals behind fences, but no livestock to be found anywhere. It was as if the entire town just got together and suddenly left in the night, leaving everything where it lay. Some say the citizens began reporting sightings of strange shadow man hanging around outside their homes in the middle of the night, standing still as a statue and looking upon their houses with unknown intent. They claimed he would only come at night, never speaking a word, then be gone by morning. No one ever saw the figure do anything malicious. No one experienced anything malevolent, but the sight of this man gave all who looked upon him a great sense of unease. Again, outsiders fortunate enough to hear of these occurrences unfolding in ambivalence considered them to be nothing more than the constraints of an over-imaginative mind or the products of their supposed uh, secretive misdeeds. In either case, this hearsay went unattended. But, after the town's members disappeared, people in the area claim to have had sightings of the Shadow Man, who has been since disappeared people in the area claim. But, after the town's members disappeared, people in the area claim to have had sightings of the Shadow Man, who has been since aptly named Mr. Midnight, the Midnight Man of Ambivalence Grove. Ask anybody in school. Everyone knows that if you go out to that old sign, under the light of a blue moon, that the Midnight Man will appear to you and lead you through the woods and up the hill to Ambivalence Grove. People say that when you get there, the town will have been resurrected in all its antiquated glory. The residents will be gathered within their own respective homes, fearful of the outside and of the Midnight Man. Their faces disfigured, their limbs contorted, bodies misshapen. Once within the town limits, the Midnight Man of Ambivalence Grove will stop at nothing in an attempt to keep you from leaving. If he succeeds, and you stay too long, he will get gain what he desires, adding you to his immortal, perpetual collection of tortured human souls, doomed to spend forever in agony. Stephanie finished up her dramatic tale. At first, I honestly didn't believe her, that there even was a local legend associated with that old sign outside of town. So, 
After lunch had ended, I decided to follow up by asking a few of my friends about it. To my absolute surprise, Stephanie was telling the truth. Apparently, nearly every kid in the school, having lived there their entire lives, had heard of this old story. Some even claimed to have seen the Midnight Man, late at night, walking the lonely roads at night just outside of town. Others going as far as to look up information on the town's recorded history. But aside from a few ambiguous city records contained in nearby townships, almost all records of its existence had nearly been erased or forgotten. As far as the rest of the world was concerned, Ambivalence Grove, New York, does not and has never existed. This is one curiosity I made sure to make special note of. The other was the definition of a blue moon, which is the second full moon taking place within a single month, something that only happens once in a great while, and was occurring the following Saturday night. My intentions were solidified. I was overwhelmed by what-ifs and the possibilities of movie-like escapades. I had to talk her into it, but it had to be Stephanie. She was a year older than I and able to drive. My friends had planned this big party at Dave's house since his parents were heading out of town and refused to give up that opportunity. Some of them were even tried to stop me by telling me of their own supposed experiences, waiting out by that old sign under a blanket of a blue moon's glow. They swore to me that the legend was real, and that they had seen Mr. Midnight, but hesitated in following him up the old hill to ambivalence. They tried to warn me, but I didn't listen, shrugging it off as an excuse for not bailing on a night of underage drinking and possibly getting laid. I shouldn't have done that. I should have listened. The plan was to meet at Dave's house, like I had told my mom and dad I was doing anyway, them dropping me off in the early afternoon before Dave's parents would leave and the festivities would begin. Once guests had started to arrive, Steph would come pick me up at Dave's and we would sneak off and explore the legend surrounding Ambivalence Grove firsthand. Even though she had formally agreed, she had her hesitations upon making her arrival to the party. But her mind was easily persuaded when I presented her with two options. One, we could remain at the party and hang out with a bunch of underage drunken lunatics doing God knows what, subjecting ourselves to buffoonery and idiocy. Or two, we could head out and avoid the foolishness by investigating something I deemed harmless and feebly conceived. Once presented with these choices, her indecisiveness swayed, and we were on our way before the beer pong table had even been set up. The night was chilly and calm and ominously still. The full swing of night had descended around us, but the glow of the full moon provided enough light to illuminate our path across the road and into the woods the sign blurry but visible through the dense vegetation in the distance ahead. A little bushwhacking and suffered abrasions from thorns, our place beside the sign, had been taken. See you soon, read the large red letters, old and cracked, its details much more articulated due to our close proximity. The two of us passed the time by doing what teenagers do without the guidance of parental supervision, including a blunt and consuming a couple of cans of beer that I had swiped from Dave's father's basement fridge. Time flies when you're having fun, and it didn't seem to take long for my watch to signal the arrival of midnight. The both of us stood to our feet, scanning our nearby surroundings for anything out of place, any sight of the midnight man. Nothing. We remained patient for quite some time, but the intensity faded out into apathy and eventually disinterest as we both resumed conversing and making out. The sound of a small twig snapping in two broke our silence, putting an end 
to our sucking face, jolting our attention back to the woods around us. <coughs> Stephanie let out a loud yelp behind me while my head was turned. I resituated my positioning on the ground to look off into the direction that she now faced, her eyes unblinking and resolute in their focused stare. Slowly and so very quietly, I stood to my feet, pulling on her shirt so as to help her to do the same. Our movements, like that of attempting to avoid detection of a very large, hungry bear, and our hearts racing in a very similar way. A distance from us, just barely noticeable and completely unmoving, stood a tall, man-like figure, his visage darker than the surrounding night. He stood as inert as the trees, and if not for the dim glow of the moonlight shining through the canopy above, we may have been unable to see him at all. I could not tell if it was a coat that the man was wearing, or just a stain on reality that blurred the majority of his torso. The outline of a wide brim encircled the circumference of the rounded black mass that formed at the top of his head. Stephanie and I gawked in awe, unable to speak. That is, until I took a gulp and hesitantly called out to it. Hello? I said meekly. The man did not move. He stood there for a few moments that seemed to pass like hours, and without any trigger or warning, turned and began sauntering off into the blackness of the trees beyond him, up the hill, towards the ruins of ambivalence that I had recently heard so much about. Did that shit really just happen? I asked intending to get a response from Steph. She said nothing, still having yet to blink. W what do you think? Should we follow him? I prodded again. Are you fucking kidding me? Finally spoke up. No way I'm going up there. I didn't think any of this was real. You saw what just happened. Who knows what will happen if we go up there? I did realize that she was probably right. So, shaken up pretty bad. The two of us started to head back for the car. Out of the woods, across the street, and to the vehicle, only to be stopped by shock and dismay. See you soon. That ominous message on the sign had been scratched down the side of Stephanie's car. Steph, your car, I said in a slight whisper. Let's just get the fuck out of here. I've had enough for one night. Stephanie said with panic in her voice. We jumped inside and she started the car with haste, the engine turning over with ease. No sooner did the motor kick over and she placed the car into drive and peeled away, speeding down the road in a desperate attempt to leave that unsettling happening behind us. Sure, we got back to town and to where we were going without issue, but all the time, I could not shake the unnerving feeling of being watched. Stephanie wasn't too keen on being left by herself to deal with things alone, but it wasn't possible for her to spend the night without serious trouble, and I had resigned myself to sleeping at Dave's house, or I may have been found out as well. The two of us embraced each other for a good night before I exited the car and Stephanie pulled from Dave's parents' driveway. Sneaking into Dave's house was really easy, as he had shown me where the key was during one of the first times that I had gone over to visit him. The house was destroyed, and if the remaining members hadn't drunk so much alcohol, the clatter of empty beer cans that I was tripping over would have surely roused them from slumber. Quietly, I made my way over to the empty love seat in the living room, one of my friends snoring from somewhere unseen in the dark and laid down for the evening, trying to forget what I had experienced, yet reveling in the fact that I had made it back, able to account what had happened. My cell phone beeped in my pocket. Now, my phone makes different noises depending on the action. Specialized ringtone of the Star Wars theme, a certain sound effect for text messages, etc. So, depending on the noise, 
I know what to expect when I pull it from my pocket. It was a text message, and the text was from Stephanie. I think he's here. Who's there? I replied. The Midnight Man. I think I saw him outside my bedroom window. Lock your doors. Are your parents home? Yes, but it's okay. I think he's gone now. Are you sure? Yes. I don't see him anymore. Probably a trick of the eyes. I'm really tired. Then get some sleep. Planning on it. I have to think of what to tell my parents about my car. Tell them I did it. They likely will blame me anyway. Hello. <laughs> You're probably right. Going to get some sleep. Text you in the morning. Night night. Night night. Once I knew she was behind the safety of her parents' doors at home, sleep found me swiftly. When I first awoke, I noticed nothing out of place. Everyone still sleeping off in the previous night of debauchery, I made my way to the bathroom. As I relieved myself, something cold, almost wet on my upper body. When I paid it further attention, I noticed it felt as though my shirt felt tacky and cold as it draped my torso. I looked down and found myself in disbelief, having to reaffirm what I was presented with by experiencing its texture through touch and visually identifying it in the mirror as if needing a third opinion. Blood. My shirt was splotched with blood. When I lifted it to check for wounds, I found myself unable to grapple with the facts of reality, questioning existence, bargaining to truly wake up. I tried calling Steph immediately. No answer. I called over and over again. Finally, someone picked up. The man on the other end I assumed to be Stephanie's father. I asked him if I could speak to her, but when he asked me who was calling, I knew it was not her father on the other end. Once I asked who I was speaking with, the person identified themselves as a Detective Williamson. I don't know if he wanted to hear my reaction or simply felt I deserved to know. Honestly, I think it was the former, but what he told me next made me tremble in trepidation. Stephanie had gone missing, and it appeared as if there was a struggle. The detective asked if he could speak with me in person, and I agreed, knowing that if I didn't, I would have painted myself guilty. Agreeing on a time in which to meet, I hung up the line and ran over to the mirror, desperately trying to wash the bloody letters scribed across my naked chest. Something had broken in, lifted my shirt without my waking, and painted, See you soon, on my chest, in blood. The passage of time unfolds events, provides life experiences, and moves on without hesitation. Like a predator crushing an anthill beneath its padded paws and doesn't even break its stride, unaware of the secret goings-on beneath his feet, the chaos and disarray caused by a lack of perspective of all things great and small. Storms come and go, Volcanoes bury villages and their people, and yet the spin of the earth continues, unhinged at what we perceive as tragedy. But such as with most formidable forces of nature, the lingering effects of experiences cause those with a conscious mind to remember these things that will go unwritten in the annals of time forgotten to all but those who remember them, or have passed down their experiences to younger generations. The fate of Ambivalence Grove 
its people, or even its existence, may have faded into hearsay and rumor, but the memories of my experiences, the fate of my girlfriend Stephanie, will never leave me. Without answers, without closure, I am doomed to relive the hell of my past on regular nightly intervals. When I first moved here, it didn't take long to make friends, and Stephanie and I were hanging out within a month after my enrollment in the local high school. It was her who had filled me in on the local legend of a ghost town named Ambivalence Grove, unexplainably correlated to a nightly apparition known as the Midnight Man. The way to ambivalence marked with an obscure sign reading, See you soon, set about thirty feet within a dense tree line off the road on the outskirts of town. The kids in the area claim that if you wait by that old sign at midnight under the light of a blue moon, that the midnight man will appear and lead you through the woods, up the hill to ambivalence where one will find the town intact, its residents fearful and tortured, and a doomed fate awaiting all. Sneaking away from a party, Stephanie tempted said fate by following this odd ritual to the letter. That night, we saw the shadow man, dressed all in black, standing ominously motionless, in the forest, and deciding it too dangerous to follow him, we watched him turn and disappear into the distance of the night. We fled, but we didn't escape. Something followed us, followed Steph. After a series of unsettling events, Stephanie wound up missing, and I was fingered as the number one suspect in her disappearance, seeing as I was the last to contact her, or, with the exception of her parents, see her alive. The investigation was headed up by a man who was named and titled Detective Williamson. Williamson was convinced that I was the culprit he was looking for. I couldn't exactly tell him all the details, or he'd have me committed or worse. Still, there was absolutely no evidence that could link Stephanie's disappearance to me, and as the weeks progressed, I heard less and less of the police and their detectives. Even then, I assumed that things only appeared on the surface as quiet and passing me over, but still waters run deep and I could almost sense the turbulence to come. Once things quieted down a bit, or at least seemed that way, I did make my way to ambivalence. Not just once, but many times. Two or three times most weeks. Of course, nearly all of these ventures occurred during daylight hours, but there was the occasional nightly trek as well. Those, however, didn't take place until towards the end, closer to the time in which I ended up where I am presently. But I'll get back to that. It started with one initial trip through the woods, past that old sign, and up that forested hill in the middle of the day. Although the thick overhead canopy blanketed most of the forest floor below in shadow, reminding me of that fateful moonlit night, the woods presented themselves as cheerful and placid, a stark contrast to its mood under the cover of night. Even as low lit as it was beneath the sunlit sky, blockaded by treetops. That first day, I expected to experience some ominous feelings or unsettling wrench in my gut. But the woods insisted on tranquility, almost mocking me in my desperation, 
because I wanted to feel that awkward sensation. I wanted something to be lurking behind at least one of those trees. Stephanie was all I could think about. Entering those woods, I was unsure of my desires. Once deep within them, I knew what it was I sought with a solidity. I didn't care what happened to me. I needed to help Steph. I don't know why, but somehow, I knew that she was still alive. Somewhere, wherever she was. It was an intuition from deep within me that I just couldn't explain, but forced me to accept. As I sauntered past the trees and flora, I couldn't help but notice the abundance of wildlife. Birds of all different songs, fuzzy-tailed rodents scurrying about, nothing but dense forest and a meadow-like path, complete with very tall grass, cut its way through the forest like an incision. It filled an area of a gap between large trees, a presence I realized to be the remnants of an old dirt road, nearly completely reclaimed by the surrounding timberland. I knew where it intended to lead me, and I followed it as far as it would take me, yonder up the mountainside. That was the day I caught my very first sight of the remnants of that old town, or what was left of it. There were many vestiges of old foundations, ruins of what used to be two-story homes, broken down into nothing but a crumpled pile of rotten lumber and sod, nearly completely retaken by the forest. But I did not notice any of these things at first. In fact, if it wasn't the decrepit testimony of what used to be a church, the only thing left somewhat standing, I likely would have wandered right by it all, never noticing this archaic museum of what once was a thriving quarry town. I fought my way through the immense underbrush and gained entrance to the structure. The interior was nothing more than a hollow shell, sunlight creeping in through the seams of the exterior paneling, draping my surroundings in stripes of shaded light. I spent hours there, in the church, searching the foundations of old homes that I discovered once I recognized I was in the place to do so. I wanted to call out to her, shout out for him to come to me, but I knew that he wouldn't appear, and Steph would be unable to give any reply. Sad, defeated, and learning nothing of use, I left with the intention of doing some research, finding out when the next blue moon would occur. Between inquiry by my parents and my dad, frequently on the one and only computer we own during his free time, it wasn't until the landscape outside was dappled in starlight that I got the chance to make use of a very popular online search engine. Locating a lunar calendar and identifying the necessary date was no more challenging than typing a few characters into a search bar. I couldn't believe it. Two months. I was expecting to have to wait much longer, but the calendar days combined with the lunar cycle facilitated an occasion that happens even much less often than the blue moon itself, two of them occurring in such a short span of time. Providence or coincidence, I didn't care. I knew what I had to do. I knew that I had to prepare. A loud whistling wind careened outside my window, nearly rattling the glass. The sky was blue all day, and the stars had been out all evening. There was no indication of a pending storm. I went to log out of the tower and stand, but before I could... Every single light in the house went black. The computer turned off, 
and I could hear my folks upstairs clamoring for candles and my father's phone, which served as his backup alarm clock for work. The power had gone out. This was clear. What wasn't clear was if the entire street was out, or if it was just us. I proceeded to walk to the window, a large bay portal which allowed for perfect vision of the surrounding homes, but my sight never made it past my parents' front lawn. I saw him there, black as night, but plain as day. He was tall, very tall, but not inhumanly so. He was either made of shadow or entirely cloaked within it, presented as a solid black form, complete with his encircling brimmed hat. He stood there, completely motionless. Startled at first, yes, but not scared in the slightest, quickly finding my resolve and bent on my own intentions. I would meet him, follow him, make him take me to her. But as soon as I went to turn for the door, the power was restored, the lights flickered on, and the soft, distant sound of the microwave powering up traversed the silent home. I instantly shot my focus back to the window, but he was gone. He was there a second beforehand, and now, seemingly vanished into thin air. The only residue of his presence were black stripes and swirls throughout the lawn where he stood, appearing purposeless. Even when I went outside to take a closer look, it proved far too dark outside to clearly discern any noticeable pattern. But I also conducted said scrutiny in a half-assed fashion. I was now on a mission and had a long bike ride ahead of me. I had no reservations about traveling out to that old sign and making my way up to the ruins of that old town in the dead of night. So, without so much as a second thought to my own well-being, I returned to Ambivalence Grove. I'll admit, in the scarce lighting, the woods appeared a bit creepier and ominous, but the forest was just as alive as it was during daylight hours. Of course, it didn't help that I had to wait until I was sure my parents were sound asleep, making it nearly 1 a.m. by the time I arrived. The roads were as silent as the woods themselves. It was a little difficult to follow the trail in the black, especially without the assistance of a full moon, but I was making good use out of the incredible flashlight app on my phone. I pretty much figured I'd see him, or at least catch wind of something off. But for the most part, I only experienced disappointment. The decrepit old town of ambivalence was nothing more than a pile of ruin, concealed by the woodland itself. The still-erected church stood high, but was still only a shell of its former self. I called out to him. I yelled into the forest for him to face me, to show himself, or itself. Nothing. I waited with anxiety, even shedding a few tears as the result of my perceived defeat. I knew that if I did not head home soon, that my mom and dad would awake before me, and getting out of the house after that would be nothing short of impossible. I let out a deep sigh and hung my head low as I began to walk away and head back towards the road. I wasn't sure at first, so I halted my movements. Looking back, I likely could have cut the tension with a knife, as cliché as that may sound. But the more I listened, still and silent, the more I became aware of a very faint whisper of a noise, dancing in the air 
in an almost impossible way. Like it wasn't there, yet it was at the same time. Like, like an incorporeal sound. Crying. I heard the almost non-existent sounds of agony, and the more attuned I became to them, the more I realized what a cacophony it was. Like a vast, unseen ocean of sorrow and pain. I was unsettled, yes, but I also felt invigoration welling up inside me. It was all real. I wasn't crazy. I knew at this moment that Steph and I would somehow be reunited, and I was now sure-footed in exactly what it was that I needed to do. Reinforced by the message I discovered the following morning, the black swirls I noticed in the front yard earlier that night. The Shadow Man, Mr. Midnight, had left me a message, and I was happy to acquiesce to his intentions. The light of the sun revealed the marks to scribe out a message in the burned remains of grass. Something my parents still believe was simple teenage vandalism. The iconic phrase, See you soon, was etched clear as day, and he was damn right. We would most definitely meet as soon as that thing decided to face me, and this time I would be ready. How long? Two months. I was forced to wait until the light of the blue moon. I had gone back to ambivalence a few times since that night, but never found anything more. Mostly a lot less, or just more of the same. It was as if there was a thin barrier between that place and some place beyond it, like something pushing on a thin piece of plastic not pervading enough to see it, but able to tell that there's something behind it. I imagined this place, this old ghost town, served as some sort of portal, and the light of the moon as its key. But as a result, I knew there was no guarantee of my return. But I didn't care. I cared only for finding Steph. This was all my idea, from the start. Her involvement was my fault, and now she suffered because of it. I would have asked a few friends for help, to accompany me, but A, I didn't want to end up responsible for their fate as well, and B, they likely would have decided me mad, maybe even refocusing the police investigation on me. So, fully prepared and Having an alibi ready beforehand, I achieved my goal of making it out to that old sign in the dead of night one last time. The night of the blue moon had descended, and I stood by that sign waiting all alone for the midnight man. Or so I thought. I waited anxiously next to that old sign, reading its words in my head over and over again. See you soon. See you soon. Yeah. I'm coming, Steph. I will see you soon. I promise. I thought to myself. I looked down at my watch. 11.57. I looked up and saw nothing but the silent and sporadically glowing forest. No sign of him. 11.58. Still nothing. I looked down once again at 11.59. And midnight. At 11.59, there was no one. I peered into the woods, anxiously awaiting the arrival of midnight, without scanning my watch, waiting to see him appear. It felt like an hour had passed, and I had to look. Midnight. And just like that, seemingly out of thin air, I looked up, and there he was. I had only shifted my gaze for a fraction of a second, but in that very small passage of time, 
He was simply there, about fifteen feet from me. He appeared no differently from the last I had caught sight of him, adorned in the blackest of blacks, from foot to hat, standing silently, waiting for me to make a move. I took a step, and he turned away from me. I trailed behind him at a steady pace, a steady distance from him, leading me up the hill through the blackened forest, towards the heart of the locally infamous deserted town of Ambivalence Grove. I never once caught notice of my secret watcher, far too distant for me to catch sight of him, but his binoculars never once lost sight of me. Detective Williamson apparently never lost interest in my involvement regarding Stephanie's disappearance, and he just so happened to decide to watch my home on that particular night, following my parents as they dropped me off at Dave's once more, and then doing the same once I left his house in the dead of night. It was when he saw the form that I had followed that he hesitated in his resolve but only for a moment, assuring himself that the shadowy mask must be some accomplice of mine, not visible due to the casting of shadows. He was convinced that I was involved in some sort of twisted teenage homicide deviance, and the sight of the Midnight Man only wavered his tenacity for a moment. And yet, as I walked, he did not follow. He was certain that I would eventually return. I wasn't as optimistic. As we reached the top of the wooded hill, the Midnight Man disappeared over the crest. I was close behind him, so I assumed that once I did the same, I would easily regain my sight of him. But in contrast, when I peered up over the ridge, I arrested vision on something else, something more astonishingly awkward and out of place than Mr. Midnight himself. Ambivalence. The town of Ambivalence seemed to be erected in all of its former respective glory. The foundations, once covered by moss, leaves, and growing trees, now stood bizarre amongst the lush forest life that still gathered in what I deemed to be old streets. Every single home in the small town, even those I had yet to discover through the remnants of foundations and rubble, the church was easily seen from a relatively large distance in the dark, was now recognizably different, almost newer. Peeled and worn away paint had now been restored, I had to snap myself out of my bewilderment. I was sure that Stephanie was here, someplace, and I had to find her. She was counting on me to find her. I ran into the first house I saw, easily accessible through the tall grass and infrequent thistles. The lights were off inside, the windows dark, but each and every home was perceived as the same, consistent in its seemingly unoccupants. When I practically burst in through the old creaky door, it was the odor that I detected first. More foul than anything I'd ever experienced up to that point in my life. Sour, rancid, like socks and old milk spread over festering meat and then spritzed with a pungent blue cheese. I gagged. I nearly vomited right there where I stood, but I swallowed it down and forced myself to press forward. A long, low, bellowing sound murmured from the next room over, through a rickety old-fashioned archway. I shined my cell light in as I turned the corner, and when I first saw it, I couldn't distinguish what it was. The image was so foreign, 
my mind struggled to regain equilibrium, the force that drove me onward and towards the pale heap with what appeared to be black splotches and blots. I heard a wet slap, and my right foot collided with the floor about halfway through the room. When I looked down, I saw it was something dark and wet, and upon further examination, I found what I feared to be true. It was blood. A pool of blood that trailed off towards the other side of the room, leading to the heap. I squinted and probed the image with my eyes. About thirty seconds passed before the breath was seemingly ripped from my chest and I nearly dropped my phone, which would have landed me in darkness. I gripped the phone tighter and covered my mouth with my other hand, trying so hard not to throw up. I couldn't identify it at first because it was so bloated, deep within the stages of decomposition. It was a corpse. What looked to be like a large, fat, bald man lay in a pile in the corner, although I assume that the man was once much thinner. His mouth was stretched wide open, far past what a typical jaw is capable of. His lips appeared to have been rotted away, leaving a rim of blackened necrotic flesh encircling the circumference of the orifice. His eyes were nothing but festering, dark, oozing pits, and his skin was so leathery and a faded shade of gray, it nearly matched his faded and blood-stained clothing, making him appear naked at first. A dripping dark slime, what I assume was mostly decaying remains of blood, still somehow flowed and dripped and ran from his physicality, causing the bloody dark slime pool on the floor in which I stepped. <coughs> my attempts proved futile as I vomited on the floor before me, and amongst my retching and stifled attempts at breathing, I heard it. Him. I looked up and that thing was moving, groaning. I turned, screamed, tore ass for the door, only making out one word that left the man's whispering lack of lips. Church. Why would I listen to the decaying corpse on the floor, you ask? Well, under the circumstances, I could give you quite a few reasons. But none of that would change the fact that I entered this damn church anyway. At first... Slamming my way through the large set of relatively new double doors, I felt nothing but relief. Joy! Stephanie was there, sitting by the front podium beyond the sea of pews. She was sobbing, but she stopped instantly when she heard the sound of my clattering entrance. With a sniffle and slight hesitation so as to make out what approached her in the darkness, she finally let the words pass from her lips. I knew you'd find me. Oh God, pl please tell me it's really you. It's me, I reassured her, moving in to embrace her in my arms. Oh God, I thought, uh, I thought, please just take me home. Steph wept as she spoke to me. It's okay, I'm gonna get you out of here. I noticed Steph's eyes grow wide in fear and then sorrow return to her face. Oh no, not again, she said in a sad whisper. When I turned, my heart sank into my bowels. My fears had been realized. I took a breath and comforted myself via remembrance of my previous resolution. I was okay with it. The door was gone. There was no way out. We even tried for hours. Hours turned into days. Days into weeks. Weeks into months. And yet we linger here. No food to satisfy hunger. No water to quench thirst. 
yet we do not die. And whether this is hell that we're trapped in, or not, it doesn't matter. I got what I wanted. I had found Stephanie. And at least, we would have each other. Together. Forever. I... I don't even remember what day it is anymore. How many days it's been. There's nothing but perpetual darkness and silence. We don't get tired or hungry. There's no bathroom, but that's okay, because we don't require one. Every once in a while, we can hear the howling and wailing of people trapped here. But outside these walls. Something disturbs them in their perpetual unrest, yet it has never ventured here. I know it's him. I know it is. Nothing here breaks the monotony of dissatisfaction and uneasiness, but I'll say this. She seems to be handling the unobstructed onslaught of grief we face every moment much better than I expected she would. Maybe it's this place, or maybe it's each other. But for the unknown time we've spent here, we've both held fast to our sanity, though I don't actually know or even comprehend how long it's been. It may have been days or years or even just a few minutes for all I knew. There's something about it. Time here either has no meaning or makes no logical sense. Like my biological clock is either gone or useless here. Unfortunately, my solid sanity and grip on memory forces me to relive the circumstances of how we've come to be trapped here on a momentary basis. It was that fucking sign. I just had to ask. I moved to a nearby town. Well, I guess it would be years ago. That's where I met Stephanie. My first acquaintance with the location was a sign on the edge of the woods on a road just outside of town that said, See you soon. Curious, I eventually asked her about it, and she told me this crazy legend about some old ghost town, haunted by a shadow figure, and only reachable under the light of a full moon. Well, apparently, the story wasn't as crazy as I first thought, because I'm the reason we're here. Like a fool, I talked her into driving me out there one night. Some creepy shit went down, the legend was real, the shadow figure known as the Midnight Man appeared. Shocked and mystified, we left in a hurry and made it back to our homes without issue. The next day, however, Stephanie was reported missing, and I became the main suspect regarding her disappearance. I knew what I had seen. What we had both seen. And I knew what had taken her. Where it had taken her. So, I researched. I investigated and waited, and one night, I got my chance. I confronted that shadowy fucker under the light of a blue moon, and followed him here. A man by the name and title of Detective Williamson watched me leave with a man in black, assured that not only would I be back, but that I was involved in some sort of adolescent homicide pact. Talk about barking up the wrong fucking tree. Had he followed me, he'd have seen that he was wrong. He would have found her just like me. But lucky for him, he awaited for my return from the comfort of his vehicle. Steph and I, however, can never leave. This building has no doors or windows, no portals for escape. But I got my wish. I had promised myself that I would find her, and every moment that passes by, I try to take solace 
in the fact that I had accomplished my goal. There's... there's no way out of here. I know I've said that. It's just... there's no hope. Steph said, speaking up for the first time in a while. It's all my fault. I'm so sorry. I said in remorse. It's okay. It's not your fault. Besides, you came for me. She said in reassurance. I know, I just... I began to speak. But the increasing psionic aura surrounding everything broke my attention. The dim glow grew brighter and brighter until I nearly had to shut my eyes. There, in the overpowering radiance of blue light. A door on the other side of the room where I had entered it was a door. I don't even think I'd had time to get my hopes up, never mind take a step, because the light and the door were both gone in an instant, leaving both Steph and I bewildered and rubbing our eyes. What was that? Stephanie asked me, but I had no rational response to give her. Still confused myself, I have no idea. How can we ever hope to escape a place that we can't understand? I asked in desperation. I'm sure Steph thought I was asking her, but I was honestly bargaining with myself, trying to grapple with this place that defied reason and natural law, bound within a set of rules far beyond our understanding. Okay, now what the fuck was that? Steph asked again. We had explored every inch of this place, looking for an escape, and found nothing. No way out. Nothing living. Nothing that used to be living. Just a vacant church, standing testament of sermons gone by, or a mockery of those that would never once again be. <sighs> so, when that sound resonated throughout the interior of this isolated hell as we both listened intently, I knew something had changed. Something was different. Something I couldn't place a finger on, other than the introduction of the new audible stimulus. As Steph and I crept forward, towards the source of the noise ever so slowly, it dawned on me. Light, natural light, was seeping in through the cracks and old seams of the church, so very subtle, but growing stronger and stronger with each step we took each moment that passed. Steph, I think... I started to say out loud, but was silenced when Steph tugged on my sleeve. Looking in her direction, I saw her arm extended outward, ending in a pointed finger. I followed the trajectory with my eyes and saw something on the floor. Something I'm sure that wasn't there before. Oh my god. Is that... Is, is that a person? Stephanie asked me. To tell you the truth, it took her suggestion for me to see it as well. My perception imposed by its twisted and distorted shape. It just kind of looked like a slithering mass to me. Pale snakes and mounds of flesh just twisting in on one another writhing about like an orgy of fleshy gray tentacles and lumps. But that final noise, combined with Stephanie's inquiry, the moving orifice that gaped in sync with that grunt, the anxiety and terror inside me turned solid and immovable, worsening to a point I didn't think possible anymore. I had to squint to truly see it in the piss-poor lighting. But she was right. That fleshy bulb at its one end, two deep sockets, the remnants of hair, and that moving pit in the lower center. It was the thing's head, and this thing had either once been a human being or was a horrific, mocking representation of one's torment. What the fuck? What the hell is that thing? I asked, but before she even had a chance to reply. Help us. 
I wanted to run. But there was no place to run to. A part of me wanted to inquire, ask questions, and maybe offer assistance. But I couldn't formulate the words. I didn't know how to react. But Stephanie did. Look there, I... I... I think he... it's... pointing. She noted to me. I couldn't react. I was beyond the capacity for rational thought, my brain awash, and my body frozen. I didn't budge, or possibly even breathe, until Steph proceeded towards the thing, but slightly off to the side, to the right of it. My expression turned to that of confusion as I noticed her start to claw and pull at the boards on the floor beneath where she was now standing. Steph, what the hell are you doing? I said, between a whisper and a yell, so as to get her attention, while attempting to avoid being noticed by the abomination squirming on the floor. Its body made cracking and squishing noises as it moved, underscoring its unnatural disposition. I wanted to move to her, and even now I don't understand where she got the courage to do so herself, although... I suppose the label of forever doomed may assist in casting off apprehension regarding one's fate. Hey, check this out, Stephanie called out to me. And finally, I had found the courage to approach the blob on the floor and reach Stephanie's side. Still, I stood further away than she. I opened my mouth to ask what she wanted me to investigate, but... When she held up the pages bound in leather and dark brown with dust, I already knew. It was a journal, and although I had yet to discover even one of its pages for myself, somehow I just knew that this was going to be our ticket out of here. What's it say? Steph asked as she leaned in over my shoulder. We had moved to the last row of pews in the back. As far away from that thing, and the podium it lay next to, as we could. Well, for one, it says that this thing was written over a century ago, I told her, noting the date of the first entry. Well, go on, read it. I licked my lips, and started narrating the first page for her. July 27th, 1895. Our little quarry town has suffered many hardships lately, mostly due to a lack of mineable materials and ore. Trade has decreased to a crawl, prompting workers to change their location of excavation. No one wanted to go in that cave, fearing the yarns folks spin around here regarding spooks and nameless terrors in there, but starvation yields a necessity that most able-bodied men are obliged to accommodate. Exploration has proven most valuable. There are desirable materials abound down there, and today specifically, one of the men found something strange. A worker happened to come across a small golden trinket inside of one of the chambers, deep inside the cavern. Once provided to the right men in charge, it didn't take long for them to bring it to my attention. I inspected the thing to find it to be... A small amulet of sorts. A small hole for running through a piece of twine. I will keep this relic for now. If there's more like this down there, our town's finance issues will be resolved. Stephanie listened intently without a word, and when I had finished, she said nothing, anxiously awaiting more. I flipped a few more pages into the book before stopping and read out loud once again. July 29th, 1895. I fear we may have disturbed something in the dark. Something meant to be left alone to rot in isolation. There's been whispers in the caves about a dark shadow in the tunnels, or the presence of something malevolent, staring at them with malice, only to find that there's nothing there. Cold drafts in the deep, where no air current should reside, a few days ago, people had come to me after service, warning me of a demon roaming the streets of town at night. 
At first, I believed them to be drunk or misinformed by their perceptions, but it's become difficult, if not impossible, to deny them any longer. The descriptions of each and every account described the beast as a shadowy mass, the appearance of a hat upon his head always looking up at their windows at night. Either this is an elaborate prank upon the priest of this fine town, for which they will all pay penance for deceit, or there really is something more. And if it is a prank, this priest is guilty of participation, because I too peered from my window last night to see this form staring back at me. Either I'm insane due to mass hysteria, or we are all in danger. Please tell me there's more. What happened here? Skip to the last entry. Steph inquired, and then insisted. I conceded by proceeding to the last recording within the journal's bindings. Once reaching it, I once again read the subsequent account. August 3rd, 1895. He came for us. I don't know what happened, but I'll do my best to describe it while I still can. I was asleep in my bed, settled down until sunrise when I was awakened by a light. A bright blue light that grew to such intensity for that moment I thought myself to be blinded as a result. And that's when the screaming started. It sounded like a cacophony of animal cries at first, but their chorus crescendoed. I realized it to be screams, the screams of men, women, and children. It's my job to protect them. I should have protected my flock. I ran out the front gate of my home, into the streets beyond, and... That's when I saw them. People. All the people in town. Mrs. Hamesley, Joe Garrison, Clive MacDonald, all of them screaming in agony in the streets, under the glow of a moon too big and too blue to be of this world. I tried to help them. I held Mrs. Hamesley in my arms, trying to comfort her, but her body just twisted and snapped into positions that should have killed her. Yet she lived, unable to properly move, unable to die. My God. So that's when I came here. I came here to pray to our Lord for salvation. But the beast, he stopped me before I could enter our church this house of God. He touched me, and without a mouth from which to speak, he whispered with a growl, Amulet. It's that accursed object. Had we not been so greedy, had we not been so quick to covet it, this beast of the blackest midnight may have been left alone to his unrest. But he's out now. And I know that the only way for escape is to return this accursed trinket to whence it came. His touch has affected me. I feel his malice and fear the torment that I am now known. He cannot touch me here. This is hollowed ground. But I carry his curse with me. The pain is growing and I already know my unavoidable fate. Let the last act I perform in the name of purity be to bind this amulet of heretics and evil to the leather of this journal. I will leave it here. If I am unable to return it to its origin, then that abomination will never retrieve it either. If someone finds this in some way unimaginable to me now, please, keep it from him. It is the key to reality, his key to the domain of earth, man, and God. May he rot in unrest with the rest of us. So that's it? Ch check the cover! Steph implored me, but I was already ahead of her. The front had nothing special upon its smooth, leathery surface, but when I flipped it over, I felt a spark of something within me that I'd almost forgotten entirely. A sensation that I longed for without even realizing it. Hope. 
A golden circle engraved with odd symbols and runes was impressed and set within the leather on the back. I stood up and began walking towards the center aisle and towards the external wall without saying a word, not wanting to get her hopes up. What are you doing? Steph asked me as I walked away, but I said nothing. I approached the dark and dusty planks of the old church wall, outstretched my hand with a book in its clutches, and touched it to the wall. No smoke, no noise, no dissolve or transition at all. There was just a door, like it had always been, unwavering in resolve. Oh my god, <laughs> a door! Steph yelled. I turned and smiled at her and waited for her to get to me before taking her hand and looking into her eyes. With my heart in my throat and a newfound hope in my heart, I gave the door a gentle push and it opened. Now, I had no clue as to where I was going, honestly, but I'd led the two of us straight to the cave from the entry. It was the book, or maybe more likely the medallion. It was like it pulled me to it, nudging me in the right direction. There was a whisper in the air. No movement, but a howl as if there was. We didn't see him, didn't hear his presence. But I knew he was there, watching us following us, and I hurried our pace. The mouth of the cavern we had entered was small, crumbled over and still with a lack of time, but stooping over and getting inside, the passages opened up to near cathedral sizes of height. I reached in my pocket for myself, expecting it to be dead due to having not been charged in an age. There was no signal, no bars but the battery was still at half-life. The same as when I had first entered this place so long ago. Apparently, there's advantages to the flow of time being halted. I turned on the flashlight app once again and crept further inside with Steph right behind me. Hearts pounding, breath heavy. The sounds of our heaving echoed off the chambers around us, punctuating the depth of the place. There were many, many turns and places of divergence, but the book in my hand drew me closer, its tug stronger and stronger with each step. It seemed like a lifetime before we reached what I knew had to be it. A chamber, deep within the maze of tunnels, an accent of red cascaded across the surface of its interior, the light source unknown, but this is where it had led me. This has got to be it, Steph. I looked at her and told her. I don't want to waste any time. Can we please just go? I took a deep breath and began walking forward into the room. I felt heat on the surface of the book, and as it grew, it threatened to burn my hand. When I investigated, I found the source to be that golden amulet, now beginning to glow red to match the shade of this room. Hotter and hotter it got as I drew towards the center, but something stopped us where we stood. The terror and loss of hope from before returned with a ferocity, shaking me to my soul. You will not leave here. Steph and I both froze. I slowly turned my head, not wanting to see what made that sound from only a few feet behind me. In the archway we had just passed through stood a shape that I had not seen in a timeless era, since the night that I had come to this wretched plane of existence. Tall, blacker than the shadows that surrounded him, the bulb on his shoulders topped off with a hat, the shadow of its brim encircling its diameter. I had nothing to say. No words came to the forefront of my lips, but Steph brave as always, had no reservations regarding her stance. You son of a bitch! I don't know what the hell you are, but you won't stop us. We're leaving this place. You've lost! 
Steph said, trying to hide her overwhelming fear. It seemed to work, as I noticed none. Child, escape is a relative term. There is no escape. You will not leave, because I will follow. What is mine is always and forever mine, and I will rebalance the scales concerning what is lost or taken from my grasp. I didn't want to hear any more. I took a step back with Steph, a few inches further into the center, and the room reacted. The red of the room, the heat of the amulet, it all receded to be replaced with a blue and a cold. A flash of light so brilliant that Steph and I were forced to cover our eyes. The glow through our eyelids waned, and the darkness of our shut eyes set in. Hesitantly, I opened them. Blackness, but not an ethereal or foreboding blackness. It was the darkness of the forest. The intensity of the full moon above the canopy seeped through the net it created and rained down within the sparse rays of pale light. There were no sounds to be heard, but it was the woods of reality, only a few hundred yards from that sign, in the sight of the road. We were home. We did it! You did it! You got us back! Step exclaimed, the existence of tears and relief underlying the tone of her voice. I turned to see a face I had begun to lose hope of seeing again, a happy smile of joy accenting Stephanie's demeanor. The crunching noise of leaves and snapping twigs from behind us demanded our attention. I dreaded the realization of what was right behind us. Freeze! I never thought I'd be so happy to hear that voice speak that word directed at me. I'd recognized it from the countless interrogations I'd endured at the local precinct. It was Detective Williamson. I hadn't realized it yet, but... We had returned on the same night I had left, as if I were only gone a couple of hours. He must have gotten really tired of waiting for me to return, as he had been waiting in the forest inconspicuously, anticipating answers or even a confrontation. I ignored his command and turned around anyway, risking the outcome of being gunned down. Man, I'd never thought I'd say this, but I'm so happy to see you. I said. Get down on the ground, now! He yelled at me. Miss, are you alright? He said to Stephanie. But before she could respond, he put his hand on my shoulder in an attempt to force me to the ground. You don't understand. You're making a mistake. I'm fine. My struggle against the detective's physical influence caused him to refocus on me. I said get the fuck on the ground! Steph approached him, trying to defend me, and pulled on his arm in an attempt to get him to release me. When he shoved her, I saw red. The devastation and trauma that I had endured, everything that I had gone through to get her back, I hit him. Probably not the smartest idea, I agree, but it was like a reflex. As the detective reeled back to retaliate, Steph approached him once more. Maybe he was startled. Maybe he was just being a dick, but he pushed her so hard, Steph practically flew to the ground. I heard the thud when she collided with it, but didn't find out until later that she had hit her head on a stone. You fucking asshole! I yelled at him. I think he had more to say because he opened his mouth as if to speak, but he never got the chance. When he shifted his position to the side, I saw something that tore my ambitions down to nothing from the inside out. No, oh, I whispered, begging with whatever may hear me to spare me from this fate, helping me to end it. Terror and relief. That's the only way I can describe it. Both emotions felt equally when the Midnight Man of Ambivalence Grove grabbed Detective Williamson instead of me. 
Detective Williamson's motion for words turned to that of a scream as he yelled out in what I can only describe as unimaginable pain, his grip released from the shock and dropping the pistol to the ground. I watched that beast, the midnight man of ambivalence, shrink ever closer into nothingness. A band of shadows like tentacles or arms gripping Williamson by the torso as the midnight man slowly grew smaller, fading from our reality. So too did Detective Williamson. I watched his body rigidly move and shift into unnatural contortions, coupled with the crack of bones and the squish of stretching and tearing flesh. The last of Detective Williamson to remain was his echoing call of agony. But the last I heard of the Midnight Man crossed the void after all was gone from perception. A debt repaid. It's been years since everything's happened, and Stephanie has all but forgotten about the event, something I'm grateful for. I had gotten us help soon shortly after we escaped the woods, after I disposed of the pistol Williamson had dropped. I knew that no one would find it in the nearby river up the road. Steph being so small, it wasn't too hard to carry her to the edge of the road. I didn't want to leave her side, so... I walked a few yards, with her still within my sight, and chucked it the rest of the way into the weeds. The subsequent splash signaled I had hit my mark. Soon after, a motorist would see us there on the side of the road, close to that sign. He didn't even hesitate when I asked him to take us to the hospital. When Steph awoke, the memory of it all began to pass, details escaping her moment by moment as if disassociating with a dream too far from the conscious mind to retain. As for me, well, Steph's memory seemed to stick upon our return. The furthest back she could remember was being attacked by the detective. I told them that I had just found her out there that Detective Williamson had been holding her captive. Dishonest, but they weren't going to believe me, and it provided me with an out. Wanted for questioning, but nowhere to be found. Their focus was thankfully shifted from me. I still have that old journal. I hid it in my parents' basement once I was able to get home. They'll never find it, and neither will he. And although I, or Steph, haven't experienced anything out of the ordinary sense, living perfectly happy lives together for quite some time, I still get anxious when the night comes. I fear he will return for me, or worse, her. Because to have escaped... Not only one has been taken, and tonight I'll shut my curtains and refuse to look outside, no matter what happens. You see, what occurs tonight is an event that only happens once in a great while, and the forest surrounding ambivalence will be bathed in the light of a blue moon.